Ladies and gentlemen, El Presidente de Games for Change, Asi Barak. Hi, everyone. Nothing is wrong with your watches, by the way. We're really behind today. Unfortunately, it's also the longest day of the conference, so I hope you brought sleeping bags, because <laughs> looks like we're staying, staying long today. Um, I want to introduce the uh, next uh, session and the moderator. Uh, what's exciting to us about uh, this thing, we're doing it for the second year. It's a contest, and you're going to watch the finals. And the exciting thing is that we can with a cash prize and obviously the contest idea engage uh, developers that are not necessarily doing the type of work that um, people in this conference are doing and they're, they're kind of pitching in. Uh, and this one is very exciting because we have very young developers, but at the same time we have Chris Crawford that you'll see uh, pitching today, who is probably um, designed the first game that I ever played, Balance of Power in the 80s. So he's really one of the legends of the industry. Um, so for Paolo, it might be the destruction of humanity. For us, it's really about uh, uh, incentive and opportunity for designers to do some exciting things that otherwise they want to. Uh, I want to introduce the moderator. Barry Joseph is one of the co-founders of Games for Change. And now he's at the American Museum of Natural History um, at the education department, doing some very exciting work with gaming, digital media, and some really cutting edge stuff. Very pleased. Asi, thank you. Fantastic. How's everyone doing? Like Asi said, it's a little bit late in the day. We might need a little bit of a stretch. What do you think? A little arm stretch? Let's practice. Arms up in the air, wave them around. Great, bring them down. I'm going to ask you guys some questions. If what I say is true for you, just throw your hands up and wave them around. Let's see, have you ever played a video game? Yeah. yeah. Excellent. All right, hands down. Have you ever been on the moon? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right, hold on, hold on. Have you ever, in a video game, been to the moon or outer space? There we go. All right. Video games can help us experience things beyond our regular world. Now, it turns out, look around, look around, one person in this hall today going to leave here with $25,000. Yes. Right. Oh, 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 sorry, sorry. One person in this room who was working really hard is going to leave here with $25,000. Yes. <laughs> oh, oh, God, uh, thank you. Thanks, Hussie. Ah, I'm sorry. None of you are going to leave here today with $25,000, but one really hardworking team that's going to be competing on this stage, is going to leave here tonight with $25,000. Oh. And Barry, the knowledge that they're... Now, now I can leave you safely on this. <laughs> Thanks, Asi. Thank you. You're going to Frosty. Thank you for helping me out with that. Thank you. Not only with $25,000, but the knowledge that they're helping to educate others about efforts you're going to hear more about in a few moments about taking humanity back to the moon and helping perhaps to not only educate about it, but contribute to that very process. Now, how hardworking are they? When we say that something is easy, what do we say? We say, ah, don't worry, it's not rocket science. And when someone does something really big and amazing, what do we say? We say, that's their moonshot. Well, these people are doing rocket science, and what they're trying to do is get to the moon. And what I'd like to introduce to you now is a rocket scientist they're helping to support get to the moon. Kafir Damali, please come on out. Fear, fear, fear Damali, excuse me. Thank you, thank you. So hello you all, uh, my name is Kfir Damari, I'm actually an engineer, a communication system engineer, a lecturer for uh, commu uh, computer networks. And three years ago, I founded uh, with two other partners, uh, SpaceIL. It sounds like a joke, uh, me, Yariv, and Yonatan, three engineers sitting in a bar and trying to think how we're going to land a vehicle on the moon. It sounds like a joke, but it's not. This is what we actually uh, uh, did. And we decided that we want to open a team competing in the Google Lunar X Prize. How many of you heard about the Google Lunar X Prize? I just wonder. Cool. So I'll tell you a few words about it. Uh, the X Prize, the X Prize Foundation, is actually a creating a contest, creating competition in order to promote science, to promote humanity. Okay. One of those competition is the Google Lunar X Prize, where the mission is really, really simple. What you need to do is to build a vehicle 
to launch it into space, to fly all the way to the moon and land. After you land, you need to send uh, videos and images back to Earth and move 500 meters. Sounds like an easy task. We thought that, we thought that would, it's really easy. We should open a team to, uh, to do that. Uh, the prize, by the way, is $20 million, which sounds like a lot of money, I think, if you whistle, but it, to land on the moon costs more, okay? <laughs> so that's another thing. Uh, anyway, that's the Google Lunar X Prize. We decided that we want an, uh, to open a, a team, uh, and this team is actually a nonprofit. Uh, other teams are commercial companies. We decided to open a nonprofit, and I'll tell you why in, in a few slides. Um, when we started, the, there were more than 30 teams. Today, there are 18 competing. Uh, but from the early beginning, we realized that you know, landing on, a moon, on the moon is huge. We realized that it's not our spacecraft. It's not the three of us. It's much, much bigger than that. We realized that a private company, and this is like the rules of the competition, said that you can get up to 10% governmental funding. So it's not government competing. It's private uh, organization. So for a private organization and even a nonprofit to achieve what superpowers have done until today, it's a huge thing. But we had something else in our mind, and it's called the Apollo effect. When Neil Armstrong walked in 1969 on the moon, his first steps, kids that saw that were excited. They, they were excited and wanted to be part of something like that. Eventually, they went to be scientists, they went to be engineers. In this example, you can see PhD students uh, from the first moment Kennedy initiated the Apollo program to the last man on the moon, there was a huge spike in, their, in the number of kids. This is PhD, but it ha happened in all ages. Uh, and this is what we want to do, okay? It happened by chance. They didn't plan that in 1969. We want to do, make sure that it will happen when we land. I won't talk too much about our, about our technologies, but just uh, a few uh, notes. These pages that you see are, actual, they are the actual pages that we wrote when we sat back then in the pub and tried to design our spacecraft. Back then it was in the size of a Coke bottle. It's a bit bigger uh, right now. Uh, it's in the size of uh, a dishwasher, I would say. Uh, but it's still really, really small. Uh, if you look into our uh, spacecraft, this is like a, a, an X-ray of the X, uh, spacecraft, you can see the electronic box, which is actually around three cellular phones. This is the electronics that you need in order to land on the moon. We have advanced, you know, our technology advanced uh, a lot since, the, for, since 1969. Most of the spacecraft is actually the fuel tanks that are needed to take us all the way. As I said, it's the smallest spacecraft that was ever designed to land on the moon, and the fact that it's so small allows us to do something else. We don't have to launch it into space by ourselves. We can actually hitchhike on a huge uh, uh, rocket, which is sending a satellite, a huge satellite, and our small spacecraft just attached on the bottom. Uh, it saves us a lot. We don't need to handle everything with, with the launch. We don't need to pay a lot of money to buy a rocket all for ourselves. But from this moment on, we need to fly all the way to the moon with our fuel, with our uh, rocket. Uh, the distance from Earth to the moon, anyone knows? A bit more? 200,000 uh, miles, okay? To understand how far it is, if you get, if you have a highway all the way to the moon, it will take you around six months to reach there. We're going to do that in two weeks, okay? Uh, and then we're going to land. Today, three years after we started, we have 20 full-time employees. We have more than 200 volunteers. Uh, we have a lot of support, uh, both in Israel, but also abroad, uh, helping us to make sure that this will happen. And when I'm saying this, is it's that we'll land on the moon, but mo most important, that those kids that will see that will, you know, will be inspired from that moment. We want to create the magic that happened when this image was taken, okay? Back then, it was a different time, it was a different world, okay? If, even if you saw it and didn't hear about it in the radio, it was, it, you, you didn't see any colors in it. Uh, we realized that today is a different world. If you want to inspire kids to be scientists, to be engineers, to understand that they are the future, that the next spacecraft, they're the one that will actually build it, you need to reach them, and it's also reaching them uh, in person, but also in order to make that effect, you need to use all the technology that exists. And we're really happy to have this opportunity 
to work work with Game for Change and the Schusterman Foundation and uh, that we had the chance to build this contest so designer will, be, will help us build a game that will reach those kids, allow them to learn through the game, but also allow them to understand that it's their job and their responsibility to be the future scientists and the future engineers. And I'm really, uh, we're really privileged to have uh, so many uh, amazing uh, designers that sent us uh, their designs, and I'm really happy that uh, to see here uh, those uh, the, the leading three, and I wish them all uh, good luck. And the last slide is I want to thank them and thank all of you because it's, it was an amazing conference also to me uh, for making this world better for our children. Uh, so that's it. That's Space AL. Wish all the luck to all the competitors. Thank you. Thank you, Fear. Fear, would you have a seat? In the judge area. So, Fear, before I explain how this is going to work, can you explain the game that's going to be selected from today? Is its goal to educate people about space or to actually perhaps contribute to the research process that you're doing to get to the moon? We really hope that we'll be able to find a game that will also will be able to use the actual game in order to put uh, data into our simulations. Okay, when you're planning all the way to the moon and say it's a long distance, you have to, lo to do a lot of simulations. Uh, but the main goal is to make sure that the kids will be inspired right. and build the next place. Keep that in mind, guys. Thank you very much. So I'd like to ask the other two judges to come out. And while they're coming out, uh, joining Fear, I'm going to explain what's going to happen now. We have three different teams. Each team has five minutes to present. After they present, the judges will ask them questions as well as share their, a critique. And then after all, everyone's presented and all the critiques have been done, this group's going to go back and huddle in the back for a few hours. And then at the 6.30 event tonight, they will announce who's won the prize. All right, can the judges come out, please? Naomi and Yaniv, thank you. Please uh, give, them a, give it up for them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you've heard, you've heard about fear. Uh, Naomi, can you um, introduce yourself, please? Yeah, I'm, is this on? Yeah, I'm Naomi Clark. Uh, I'm an independent game designer here in New York City. I've been making games for around 20 years. Thank you. And I'm Yaniv Rivlin, and I'm a program officer at the Charles Lynn Schusterman Family Foundation, and it's a real honor to be here, so thank you. Great. So I'm, uh, uh, please give me a round of applause. Welcome out our first group, Moon Rush. Okay. So there, I'm going to time them five minutes. When the five minutes up, you'll hear a little beeper go. If you're in the middle of a sentence or a thought, please take the time to finish up, and then we'll shift over to hear what the judges have to say in their critique. Uh, they were supposed to give it to you. Let's get one. Uh, if you can hear me in the back, we're looking for the mic. We'll take one of these over here. I'm holding one of the judges' mics. Testing. Great. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Cheng Zhang from the Ohio State Uni University. This is my uh, teammate, uh, Sherry Larimer. Uh, we are here to demonstrate our design, Moon Rush. Moonrush is uh, designed as a crowdsourcing game that can collect users' data uh, and the creative ideas um, to inform uh, space AL team. This is the old way to get to the. This is the old way to get to the moon. Uh, for the new way, we need your help. You could be one of these people in the control room. Um, there's a lot of fun things to do as a mission controller. For example, uh, if you have wonderful simulation uh, models, ideas, you can send them in. If you have an awesome design about a rocket, a spacecraft, you can load them up. For example, uh, the spacecraft, the, the Sparrow, original designed to hop on the moon. Um, our, our player, to change it to roll like a lunar rock, you can also figure out the way to the moon. Um, as a player, if uh, you can drive the spacecraft in any direction as long as the fuel is available. Um, so here uh, you can see uh, our underneath simulation model will um, can predict and display the whole trajectory, the whole trajectory of the spacecraft uh, in the real time based on the current user's uh, input. You can see this trajectory is far away from the moon. 
So you need a more thruster. So at this point, take a guess. Do you think uh, this spacecraft is going to reach the moon? Yes, it is. So here you go. And uh, so however, during the landing, if the spacecraft run up the fuel, uh, the most likely it will be crash landing. <laughs> okay. So as a mini game, um, player will encounter the obstacles such as meteoroid. Um, the magic particle is also part of a uh, game environment. The, the meteoroid and the, uh, the particles are generated randomly, uh, which provide replay ability. All these elements are designed to provide the players with the situation in which um, player need to make a decision and trade off among all available uh, options. Just like uh, the real space um, exploration, um, there's a uh, um, lot of dangers and uncertainty. So use of this uh, decision making involve um, risk will excite it and uh, thrill the players. So um, after you, uh, after player safely lands on the uh, moon, uh, player has the opportunity to explore um, what does it look like on the moon. So here we go. Um, uh, we are, uh, the, the player actually land on the uh, Charles Little Valley, the Apollo 17's landing site. So you will see here's the sun, and uh, there's a uh, lunar lander, and the moon buggy, probably left by the crew of the Apollo 17's, and uh, you can explore it, um, take a look. Maybe there's a craters you can jump high and uh, take a look. Um, if you were on the moon, what would you do? Taking pictures? Maybe selfies? <laughs> we know, um, <laughs> we know uh, President Obama loved to take selfies, right? <laughs> um, so, so we're gonna take, a, we're gonna take a selfies. Um, you hear that? Uh, okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna take a look at what does uh, what does a selfie look like? Hold on a second, bear with me. <laughs> yeah. So I think this is the one. Here we go. We see uh, President Obama on the moon. Um, Um, we believe we believe a moon rush will contribute the new Apollo effect that will inspire the young generation to think differently about um, science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, I would like to thank the Schussmann Foundation and the, uh, the Games for Change Conference for provide this uh, great opportunity so that we can come here share our design. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Moonrock. Moonrock, please have a seat. Please have a seat. So for the next five minutes, um, this is the opportunity for the judges to ask further questions as well as to give critical feedback. You can have a seat. You can stand if you want, but it might be more comfortable sitting. <laughs> and my question is... Use the mic. Oh, yeah, your mic. Work? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Uh, first of all, you've done amazing work. All the, the also the demos that you already prepared. So first of all, thank you. Uh, I want to ask. Um, you showed like a lot of different parts and aspects of the game, but I wonder how do you see it working together? And moreover, how do you see it working together in, in a way that kids can actually learn science through the game? Question ask um, there's a, a like a, a, because this is a serious game if from the uh, uh, 
the goal to provide a space cell team with a re reliable scientific uh, data, right? That requires like uh, advanced uh, sy systematic knowledge about aerospace engineering, uh, rocket science, those things. Those, those uh, requirements kind of can uh, scare away from like uh, beginners, right? Like a middle school student has just started to pick up serious study about science, right? So we uh, in, involve a lot of elements, for example, tapping in, uh, increase the, the moon mass. Uh, in reality, we know nobody can do that. Increase the mass of the moon, nobody can do that, right? But think about differently. If you run out of the fuel, um, there's a way to kind of protect this happen. When we tap the uh, operation, increase the uh, moon mass, which means increase the gravitational pull. Uh, when this gravitational pull is large enough, the spacecraft will automatically fly to the moon without consuming any fuel. Uh, this is actually is a two equivalent uh, mechanism. The, you, this, lead, uh, this, will, uh, for, uh, this is a kind of like a, you increase the mass, increase the uh, gravitational pull. On the other hand, it's a similar, it's a equivalent to uh, fire the rocket to the course correction, right? So this is actually a uh, lead to player to think about underneath the relationship of the mass, gravity, and uh, the fuel consumption. So I think this is uh, uh, one example we can do that. When, this, when the, uh, the uh, I think as far as the like integration of these different mini games that we've made, I see it as the, um, the navigating to the moon as being the main game and the player can enter into these mini games or not depending on whether or not the player is interested. Um, so like if they're getting kind of bored of the main, you know, just firing the thrusters game, then they could enter into one of these um, meteoroid mini games. And um, you know, if they get to the end, then the exploring the moon is sort of the ending mini game as the reward for having successfully completed the uh, navigation game. Guys, but I'd encourage you guys to offer some critiques during the two minutes that remain. So one thing that I, I wasn't sure about in your presentation was that you, you describe your, your project as having two sides. On the left side, you had the, uh, the blue column that showed um, a simulation that, you're, that I think you're suggesting that members of the public can contribute models to help the Space IL team. And on the, on the right side, you had a uh, uh, the yellow box, which I think is what you're showing for most of the presentation, is that correct? Yeah. Yellow box is a user, uh, is a, is a player uh, load their uh, design. Right. Uh -huh. And then, and is it is is when, once the players load their designs, are they is that what they're using for for the the rest of this experience, where they're they're launching and and traveling to the moon and then trying to land on the moon, navigating the asteroid field and uh, and doing a spacewalk. The, yeah, I, I just wasn't totally clear about how those those parts work together. Like the, the models that are being submitted to the Space IL team, are they part of this experience as well? Do they work in conjunction with the the designs that are in the yellow box on the right side? Um, the the reason we uh, propose the two modular uh, the structure, uh, the one way is uh, the 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 Space IL team always has uh, you know the right to uh, customize what the exactly want the simulation model is, right? What the type of the, the data you want, right? So they actually can, um, we, we're going to provide interface. So Space AL team will have this, their own criterion or like uh, uh, the filter. So they can filter out those uh, data is not meet their criterion. So that part can, can uh, keep uh, the fun part keep the player engaged meanwhile, and uh, for the Space L team, still can have some serious data, reliable data, so that you can use to analyze, to get some important things from the data. Thank you very much. Please yeah, give it up for you. Moonrush. <laughs> thank you. Take the next one. I'll also invite uh, Yanni, Fear, and Naomi to come over here, because we're going to invite to the other podium, Rocket Science. Please give it up for Rocket Science.
And as I told the others, I'll give you five minutes. Okay. Uh, when the five minutes goes off, if you're in the middle of a thought or an idea, feel free to finish up. Okay. Let's see if we have a, uh, if we have a computer here. Do, do, do. Nope. Ah, there we are. Okay. This is rocket science. This is a physics game. Now, physics, as you know, is ugly. It's mathematics and numbers and calculations and all that awful stuff. And Well, I think I'd come up with a way to, to sort of sneak around some of the worst aspects of that. What are you going to do in this game? You're going to fly a rocket to the moon, land a payload safely on the moon, and to do that, you're going to need a rocket with three stages. The first stage gets you into orbit. The second stage gets you to the moon. And the third stage gets you, lands you on the moon. So, oop. I will pause okay. the timer. Actually, that's worse, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> Let's see, okay, the, uh, here's where you design your rocket. And the base, oh, that's not where you design your rocket. That's the Andromeda galaxy. Oh, that, that looks better. While the tech is working on it, if it takes more than a few seconds, I'll encourage the uh, judges to ask a question if they want until we get it going. If you have something ready, if you don't, that's okay. I don't want to put you on the spot. Okay, well. So, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll take a couple of seconds to, uh, to ask a question. First of all, thank you so much for preparing um, the great proposal. One question that we, that we had and you alluded to um, is one thing that's very important for the Space IL team is getting the crowdsourcing yeah. from, from the game. Um, and you thought that it wasn't the best idea. Yeah, uh, I called it a stupid idea. Stupid <laughs> idea. <laughs> um, which which is a great thought. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, first of all, what's behind it? And are you going to be willing, assuming that you win the competition, to actually focus on sure. that? Sure, sure. I mean, you want to know how many people uh, played it on Tuesday afternoon between 3 and 4? I can give you that. Uh, it's just, see, the question is whether this is uh, an educational game or an engineering simulation. Now, if it's an educational game, you want to make it simple and clear and obvious. Ah, oh, there we go, there's something. But if it's an engineering simulation, then you want to make it complicated and detailed. So those two things work against each other. And there are compromises you can do. And yeah, I mean, if this is really important, we'll have to do a lot of back and forth. But uh, there is a fundamental uh, opposition here, contradiction, that has to be worked out in order to achieve two mutually uh, contradictory goals. So that's the problem. Um, so maybe I wasn't very diplomatic <laughs> explaining <laughs> it, but uh, that's the basic problem you got. So. Chris, does this give you what you need, or are we still working to get what you need? Uh, that's, that's perfect. All right, Great. let's thank the gentleman who's helping us, and everyone backstage as well. Okay. I think sometimes we getting to the moon is easier than running, putting a conference on. So Chris, we'll continue from where you were. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so here we go. You got, you're going to design a rocket here. By the way, all these numbers are based on the Ariane 5 data. I, I didn't, I should have used some of the numbers more appropriate to the Space IL design, but all these numbers were easy to find. So basically, you decide how big you want each of the rocket stages. And you can do that by using these little arrows here and make it smaller or make it bigger. You can change the size of the boosters or whatever. And uh, when you've got the rocket laid out the way you want it to, you say next. And now you've got to figure out the rocket tilt curve. Um, you know how a rocket, when it takes off, is going straight up? But then as it gets up into the sky, it starts to tilt over. Well, how fast should it tilt? I mean, should it you know, go way, 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 way up and then tilt? Or should it start tilting low or what? Well, here's where you get to choose that. But you don't have to give any mathematical equations. You just set this number here to make it more convex. Or you can make it more concave. And so you just play around to get the curve that you think looks best. And now you're ready to launch your rocket. And at this point, you don't do anything. You just watch. So you launch the rocket. 
and off it goes up into space. You can pause at any time and check the telemetry coming back from the rocket. And say, oh dear, wow, 2138 meters per second. Mm, very important. And then you can, you know, you can replay it, whatever. Uh, but now that your rocket is in orbit, now you're in a parking orbit. Now the idea here is, your craft is going around the Earth, and you need, you have a very narrow window where you have to fire the second stage to shoot you off towards the moon, but the problem is that window is very narrow and you gotta be exact. And the way you do that is by adjusting this number here, which is the, the point in the orbit where you want it to, whoop, it, 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 there. And when you got it right, you say go for burn, and poof, it fires, and off you go. Translunar injection is what the rocket scientists call it. And, okay, we made it to the moon. So now, we go to the landing tilt curve, which is exactly the same as the launch tilt curve, only backwards, because you're landing now. And you can fiddle around with that one. And, uh, doo -dee doo So then you proceed to the final step, the actual landing, and there's nothing for you to do at this point. You've already set in all of the other parameters, and so you simply say, begin. And you can get the telemetry coming back, seeing how, how it's doing, and this is very, very tricky because you had to slow down as you land, and you, if you hit too hard, you're gonna crash. So uh, you've got to reach the, uh, the surface of the moon with just a very low velocity. Now, I'll point out, I have rigged all the numbers in this demo to make everything come out nice and hunky-dory. In the real game, <laughs> not so easy. In the real game, we'll get you in the ballpark, but you're going to have to do a lot of experimentation to figure out how to actually make this thing work. And the problem is that... Uh, if you do just stupid experimentation, it will take you days. But if you think about the physics involved, you know, rocket engines can speed you up or slow you down. If you think at, about the physics at a phenomenological level, a qualitative level, then it'll go much faster and you'll get to a much better solution. Also, one of the things I didn't mention is that in the rocket design, the bigger you make the rocket, the more expensive it is, and you want to do it for minimum amount of expenditure. So, that's the game. Rocket science. Hooray, hurrah. Thank you. Right on time. Thank you, Chris. So, Chris, feel free to stand or have a seat for the next few minutes. Oh, the judges yeah, you might have some share questions. Share a critique with you or ask you some questions yeah. because they had some time with you before to be fair to everyone else. I'm just going to move back to four minutes if that's okay with you guys, but then feel free to, again, ask questions or critique as you see fit. So uh, this game is intended for an audience of students between ages of 15 and 25. Yeah. So let's say, let's say you have a 15-year-old student who's, sort of, who's interested in space, but you know, hasn't had a lot of physics yet. Yeah. Coming to this for the first time, doesn't, doesn't know where to begin their experiments. Oh, yes. Or, and you know, and I, I mean, the, the prototype graphics, we can ignore those and say, like, okay, you know, maybe a little friendly or introduction. But how are you going to get that student started? Yes. He's really excited about doing a, a moon launch and just is falling flat on their face when they're yeah. like sticking yeah. numbers into the sim. Yeah, I, le I, I did this as a prototype where all I'm trying to do is show that I have handled all the difficult parts. And I've done this so many times, I just figured, well, it's obvious. You just stick in a few help screens. <laughs> and so, yeah, in fact, in the very first version of the design, I had a little question mark up in one corner, and you click on that, and that can take you into a hyper tree of explanations. You can go as deep as you want, and we can get really technical if you want to drill down that deep. So, yeah, that kind of stuff is really easy to add on. I just I was too lazy to stick it in. So you're thinking that the, the, the sort of prerequisite to being able to do a successful experiment uh, would be to, sort of, to go through some of the material in, in like a textual, textual format to like learn the basics before you get to the point where you can do experiments that start being not completely yeah. unbaked. One of the things I'm still torn about is that, uh, I don't, I have some sneakily hidden fixes where you get in, all you need to do is get into orbit and the next stage, you're in a nice, clean, circular orbit. In reality, you'd be in this wild ellipse. Well, 
I get rid of that ellipse and put you in a circular. Same thing with approaching the moon. I just show you, you reach the moon, and now the next thing you know, you're flying horizontal, parallel to the surface. If I really want to do this right, I'll, I'll put those, the actual uh, dynamics in, but that's going to make it a lot harder. So my thinking right now is to do two levels. In one level, it automatically cleans up those problems for you, and once you've mastered that, okay, now we're going to give you the hard part, where you have to actually get a decent circular orbit, and you have to actually, you can't come straight down at the moon, you want to fly parallel to the edge and come down smoothly, so. That's my plan. Yeah. First of all, again, amazing presentation. Uh, my, my question is, uh, uh, your presentation actually showed all the different stages uh, uh, to landing, and you said that you're thinking about two levels. But besides you know, going from level one to level two, what kind of game mechanics do you think we can have there to make it like fun for people to play over and over and maybe even share it in a way? Uh, oh, boy. Uh, yeah. The uh, replayability is normally accomplished through uh, injecting random elements. And I'm, uh, everything, I, I could not come up with a good way to inject random elements that are also physically realistic. Uh, you know, you just, uh, <laughs> there aren't many good things there. I was thinking, well, maybe we could give them variable payloads. Uh, the, the plan for Space IL is a 40 kilogram final payload. Okay, what if we say try it at 50 kilograms? It doesn't scale linearly. Mm -hmm. So as you try to go up to higher payloads, you, can, uh, you get a different set of factors. That was one idea I had. Um, I won't, the others are too complicated and not very good. So it's hard to come up with you know, massive replayability. Chris, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Let's give it up for Chris and Rocket Science. And uh, Yanni, if you're Naomi, for the last time, I'll ask you to move over here. Thank you. And we'll call out Space IL Academy. Please give it up for Space IL Academy. And as with the others, we'll give you five minutes. Let me change it to the four. And again, if the timer goes off and you're still talking, take your time to bring it to a conclusion. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Vince, and this is Jasmine, and we are from Theorify out of Long Beach, and we're here to talk about our game, Space IL Academy. Our goal is to raise awareness towards Space IL and the Israel journey to the moon through clever branding and fun, engage players in learning STEM skills through fun space-related puzzles, provide real-world impact on the Space IL spacecraft engineering design by crowdsourcing a Newtonian physics-based 3D flight simulator and fun, which would which would be more fun than combining Star Trek and Harry Potter into an animated 3D flight simulator game. Space IL Academy is a massively multiplayer online role-playing adventure when you get to play as a cadet at the Academy with your own unique avatar, customized spaceship where you fly to the moon and collect samples to study and puzzles. In designing this game, we made sure that every element of the game felt expansive but tied back to the core loop that keeps the player engaged in attempting over and over again to fly to the moon and crowdsource data for Space IL mission. Let's go through some of the features in these mock-ups. So here at the Academy, you're represented by your unique avatar. As we pull up our smartwatch, we can navigate through the game and we'll start at the flight simulation. And we'll just go ahead and choose this green moon here. We'll call it Plutar. And in the flight simulation, you have full six directional controls with pitch, yaw, and roll. And you can switch your camera view from, sorry about that, switch your camera view to third person trailing if you like. And fuel consumption is part of the game. You can also customize the look of your spaceship in your garage. And on your missions to the moon, you can collect unique samples, which you can then use to analyze in the puzzles later on in the game, and I'll show you. So you have an inventory and a catalog of all the samples that you could ultimately collect. You have a mission log where you are given 
suggestions on what to do in the game, as well as homework, which are simple little puzzles. And we'd really like to get some feedback from Space IL as to what kind of educational goals that they have in order to direct what these puzzles should be. We have a couple suggestions. One is a hidden puzzle stellar object game where you're given space objects to find quickly. Or a uh, navigation puzzle where you are trying to pick the best path from one place to another with a limited amount of fuel. The game has a lot of social elements where friends can either help or challenge each other. This also adds to the virality of the game. Your unique avatar can be customized from your clothes all the way down to your eye color. There are a lot of achievements that you can earn in the game, um, and also a hall of records where you can challenge your friends on social media to try to beat those records. So just to recap, in our game, you learn how to pilot your own spaceship, train for moon landing missions in 3D, collect extra extraterrestrial samples, upgrade and tune your spaceship, solve fun puzzles in science labs, and customize your unique avatar. Do we have enough time to uh, show? Yeah, we should show that. So as part of our demonstration, we actually did a proof of concept for thrusters that have the full directional control. Let's make and sure this actually we're uses, seeing what you want us to see. Do we lose it? So if we were seeing it, what might If we you were seeing, seeing it, uh, <laughs> this is a 3D simulation where the lander in our model is not exactly the same as the space IL design, but in the physics, it actually is. It's the right weight, it's the right size in comparison to the moon and the moon's gravity, and it moves in all, all the directions, this way, this way, <laughs> forward, back, up, down, as you're speeding towards the lunar surface. So... Would you like them to come out and see if we can see the actual? Are you okay yeah, with the description? I'm not sure. Yeah, if I, you, you don't mind coming out and giving them a hand? I'll pause the timing again. This is our second one. No, no, it's not showing. So you having a good time at the festival? How's it going? Okay. <laughs> where are you going to have dinner tonight? Do you know where you're going? Uh, no. no one knows. Who knows where? Yeah, do you know where we're having dinner tonight? Do you know where you're going? <laughs> Peggy, where are you going for dinner tonight? <laughs> Indian food? If, in, Peggy's great. If you're looking to have Indian food, you want some great company, Peggy's awesome. Peggy. Um, let's see. Ellen makes it look so easy at the Oscars. Um, what was something you learned today that you liked? Not ordering pizza. What was something you learned today that you liked? Something new for you? From this panel? Well, the whole day. The whole day. Yeah, the whole day. Um, no, oh, they're ready. Okay, we'll, keep, we'll come back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Very you Joseph, ready? everybody. Very Joseph. So what are we looking at? We are looking at a 3D proof of concept of the thrusters. The moon has the uh, correct gravity and for Earth's moon. And the weight of this craft is the 388 pounds that the Space IL craft would be at launch. Um, what this doesn't show that the final game would is some um, procedural generation as you get closer to the moon the landscape would become more detailed, uh, collision effects, and things like that. Great. Thank you, Space IL Academy. <laughs> so as we saw in the last two rounds, you guys will have five minutes to receive both questions and critiques. I recommend keeping responses short if you want to get more questions, or you can keep talking longer if you want to eat up the time. But it's up to you to help them figure out how to evaluate what you guys have presented. First of all, really amazing all the uh, designs that you did, all the, the graphical designs is, was amazing for me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is that we want kids to both be excited from the game and hopefully in a way communicate for it, mm -hmm. and, but we want them to learn. And if we're thinking about learning, we're thinking about uh, gravitational forces or like what is it to uh, plan an interplanetary mission, like mm -hmm. the way to the moon? Uh, and 
where in your game you see that that's happening. For example, if, you, if it's like you're flying your spacecraft, so you're not aware from, of all of the things that happens around you. You just see it like through your eyes flying all the way to the moon. Uh, so do you have any ideas of how can you take that and actually create uh, something that kids will be able to learn the physics out of the you know, flying 3D animation to the game? I think that there are a lot of opportunities for heads up display of tips and tricks and this is why this is happening or this is why you weren't successful in this mission and also the puzzles are the best way in order to teach those educational concepts to all types of people who want to play this game. We wanted to make this game really accessible to people who weren't yet excited about space and space travel and get them engaged with all of the ideas around STEM. So um, I, I was very impressed by, by your visual design, by all the thought that you put into the you know, character creation and social features. Um, your concept does have a lot of features. So there's uh, multiple puzzle games which are used to teach STEM concepts. Um, there's, a, there's a collectible economy of resources that players can use to sort of customize and upgrade their crafts as, as well as their, their avatars. Um, there, there are sections you know, where you, you get your friends involved to help you um, get additional resources in this sort of a, f a free to play mm -hmm. viral um, multiplayer online game. And, and I guess this is also intended to be a, a, an MMO for kids, right? Mm -hmm. Where you're actually in a space with other players at the same time. So this, this gives me a concern about the scope of the mm -hmm. project, given that the, this competition is for a $25,000 um, prototype. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, for, for that, that scale of budget, what percentage of the features that you're describing here could be expected to be seen in prototype format, uh, to, be, to be played and experienced by kids, if you, if you guys are assessing um, what it would take to do all of that? So certainly there are things that could not go into a prototype, and a prototype is, is to really drill down a lot of the core loop components of the game. And so in, to answer your question, um, while the request was to put this out on the web, I think there's a great opportunity to put this out on mobile. And if the prototype was on web, a lot of those social components are, would, be, would not be able to be a part of it. Whereas for mobile, there are a lot of kits that are available for developers to plug things into their game for Facebook and Game Center and Twitter and, and all of those, those things combined. So a lot of the social components would not be in a prototype. But the flight simulation would be in a prototype. At least one puzzle based on the feedback that we could get from Space IL as to the educational goals that they want to hit. Um, and I think, does that answer the question? Yeah. That, that okay. does, thank you. Um, second, short question. Um, I saw so that one of the things you can upgrade on the, on the spacecraft mm -hmm. are, are wings. What would you say the purpose of wings are for a spacecraft? It's more of an aesthetic thing. Uh, the different moons, the different spacecraft parts, most of that is to give varied play so that you have some reason to come back and do it over and over again to help collect that data for Space IL. So that even though you're doing the, the same path over and over again, you may win over and over again, you're getting something different out of it each time, whether it's now I get a new part or I get to go to a purple moon instead of a green moon and it looks a little bit different and, and now I can go tell my friends that I got to go to this moon even though the physics are mechanically the same. Uh, gotcha, so wait, to make sure I understand correctly, when you are launching out of this, the academy and going to a moon, the, you're experiencing cosmetic differences and maybe you're unlocking more moons, but you're thinking that the physics, mm -hmm. the, the, the various constants involved, the weight of the moon and the weight mm -hmm. of the craft and so forth, are all based on the on space Earth. IL yes, that's um, correct. data. Okay, thank you. And that is time. Thank you so much. Please give it up for Space IL Academy. Thank you so much. You can take the, the mic with you when we go back. Thank you. And please also give it up for Yanni, Fear, and Naomi. Thank you very much for being here. But now this is when they get busy. So guys, get out of here. Go back and go talk and discuss and debate. And an hour from now at 6.30, they'll be back here. I hope you'll be here too, to where I believe if I saw on the schedule, um, Jesse Shell is going to be serenading James Paul G. Or maybe I didn't read that right. But during that time, during that time, you will definitely hear the announcement of which of the three teams you just saw present will be leaving tonight with $25,000. Thank you all so much. We'll Before later. we start the Games for Change Awards, we have another, we have a very special award that is going to happen. First, we, you are going to hear the winner 
of the Shoot for the Moon contest. And that is a contest for the first company to establish a colony of children on the moon. That, that can't be right. All right, anyway, we're going to have Seth Cohen from the Schusterman Family Foundation come on out and give this very important award. Hi, everybody. Um, it's, uh, I'm just glad that someone hasn't shot me to the moon yet, and I'm glad I could be here with all of you today. And I want to first thank Asi and the Games for Change team. Um, Woo! It's amazing what they've done. It's amazing. And um, I just told Asi earlier that I've been working in philanthropy now for the past several years, and this is the first time my kids actually think I do something cool, because when I told them <laughs> I was going to a video game conference, they're like, that's so awesome, Dad. We really are proud of you. So thank all of you for giving me that moment. So um, I do work at the Charles and Lynn Schusterman Family Foundation. It's a global foundation originally from Oklahoma uh, that supports a variety of causes in the Jewish community, in Israel, and in public education, science, technology, math, things that all of you care about and that a lot of the game designers that were part of this competition care about. Our founders, Lynn and Charles, believed that if you have a young person with a good mind, you have a lot to work with. And I think that's really evidenced by everything we've seen here at this conference and that we've heard today. And we also know that youth is really a state of mind. It's not a number. So there's a lot to work with here at this conference, and there was a lot to work with at this competition. Um, a few, I guess about 18 months ago, my colleague, Yaniv Rivlin, who was earlier on the stage as one of the judges, uh, said to me, we really need to get involved with this Games for Change idea, because what we do in philanthropy is we're playful, and we take risks, and we are bold, and we think big, and what we realize is, is that we can't do it by ourselves. It actually takes a lot of different people to take risks, to be experimental, and that's what gameplay can do, um, not only for us as a philanthropic team, but for us as change makers around the world. And so we actually brought a group of our grantees here to New York to get trained by the Games for Change team uh, to think about how they can incorporate gameplay, game concepts into the work they do to make social impact. Um, those eight grantees had a few days here in New York, and ultimately one of those teams was selected uh, to be the kind of subject of the competition, Space IL. And since then, we as a foundation, our grantees, and our team of over 40 people from around the world that work on the Schusterman philanthropy um, have been thinking about how we incorporate the concepts that all of you know so well and so much that we learned over this conference into the work we do. So um, while there's some winners today of this awards and these competitions, we actually at the Schusterman Foundation think that we're big winners in all of this too. And I hope you'll check out what we do um, as a foundation. We like to be on the cutting edge. We like to hear new ideas of ways that we can transform values into impact, new ideas into energy that will change the world, both the Jewish world, the non-Jewish world, Israel, and everywhere in between. So with that, I also want to just thank you again for giving us this opportunity. So that was enough about us. Now to the winner. Uh, we had two winners uh, in this competition. We originally were only planning to have one winner, and then um, after a lot of discussion and some of the great proposals that came in, um, we decided to have a People's Choice Award uh, and give people in the audience and people online the opportunity to look at the proposals that you saw uh, earlier today and think about what games they thought would be the right, uh, the, the right selection to make. Although, of course, we decided to make the selection by ourselves. We empowered people as part of our own gameplay. And uh, the winner of the People's Choice selection is the Moonrush team from the Ohio State University. So. so now I'd like to invite the judges out who were also part of the selection process for the award that we're going to be awarding, which to remind you is, if I could invite the judges to join me on stage, they're also carrying the big check. Come on out, judges. They're so shy. Come on out. They're, they're so shy. Um, give a big round of applause for the judges. And uh, as you all know before, one of the judges is Kafir from Space IL. And he spoke so beautifully before. I, I'll tell you a, a little bit of a secret. Three years ago, before the Space IL initiative was created, um, 
and they were actually conceptualizing, it was just, they had just conceptualized the idea of putting a rocket on the moon over a few beers um, after seeing the, the X Prize competition. Um, I, I met them, we were walking in Jerusalem and we had a long walk and we were speaking and we ended up finding our way in a very unusual part of Jerusalem that was being built and uh, it, we, had, we, we were gonna have to turn around and walk all the way back and these three rocket scientists figured out a way for us to climb over the, they built a whole contraption for us to climb over a fence around, and that was how I knew they were eventually gonna put a rocket on the moon. So best of luck to our friends from Space IL. So these three judges sat back and had a very, very serious deliberation because there were three amazing teams that uh, proposed an idea of how to build this game uh, to help put a rocket on the moon while educating young adults and children about science, technology, math, and the, and, the, and the real science that is going into this project. And it was not easy. And they thought about it and they discussed it a, a, a great deal. Um, and as a result of their deliberations, it's my pleasure to announce the winner, the award winner who will receive $25,000 to help build that game and create uh, that extra education and extra incentive to help end to help put a rocket on the moon. And the winner of the Shoot for the Moon design contest is Space IL Academy, the Therify team. And I will invite them to come accept the big check. Yeah. Is the team here? Because I'll take that big check. All right, we'll put it in a big envelope and we'll send it to Perfect. him. It'll be magnificent. All right. Well, thank you all again, and uh, keep your eye on shooting for the moon. All Bye. right. Woo!